And now, please welcome to the stage, Managing Director, Healthcare Group, Alvarez and Marcel, Deborah Richman, who will be interviewing the CEO of CVS, Larry Merlo. Uh, Larry, it's great to be here with you today, speaking with you. Uh, your personal journey at CVS is very compelling. Can you please share with us how your personal experience has shaped your corporate vision for CVS? Yeah, Deborah. First of all, it's great to be here. Thanks for uh, thanks for moderating this session. And you know, it, it's been really shaped by a few things. I would say it really began with my education as a pharmacist. When I uh, began my working career, I was a practicing pharmacist for uh, People's Drug Store in the Washington D.C. area. That's more than 40 years ago. But you know, I saw firsthand the health needs and challenges of the customers that I was serving and the role that pharmacists played in the community in terms of being a very accessible and trusted health professional. I think another experience that every one of us in this room can relate to, it's, it's our own life experiences, whether it's as a patient or as a caregiver for you know, a family member. And we all have our individual stories about you know, those experiences and the challenges that we faced at, at that point in time and what would have made that experience better. You know, this has certainly impacted, I would say, our purpose uh, as a company at CVS. And, you know, years ago we had a mission and a vision. And they were paragraphs. We, uh, you know, we all had them up in our offices. Uh, they were in our break rooms all across the company. And I think what we found is we had challenges in terms of what do those words mean? How do we bring them to life in terms of our day-to-day -day actions? You know, and several years ago, we, we got a, a team of uh, colleagues across all the various disciplines in our company, and we talked about our strategy, and we said, what is it that we can do that would bring that strategy to life for our thousands of colleagues? They did a great job. You see what they came up with on this slide? Eight simple words. Our purpose to this day, our North Star, is helping people on their path to better health. And it comes to life uh, with our 300,000 colleagues every day in ways big and small. Great. When we look at healthcare today and we look at healthcare tomorrow, we see a system that is very payer and provider centric moving to a system that is very consumer centric. Um, I think most people in this room would agree it's a system that is unsustainable. You are redefining healthcare delivery in the United States. Can you share with us how you see healthcare today and where you see it going in the future? Yeah, I would say today's healthcare system is largely identified by the rising costs in care. And uh, in the video that we just saw, we saw some of the stats. As an industry, almost $3.7 trillion. I saw some stats recently that left with its current trajectory by 2027, healthcare will approach $6 trillion. 18% of GDP today, imagine, you know, it's $6 trillion, it's got to go over 20%. And, you know, we also know that uh, out-of-pocket costs for families for several years now have risen uh, faster than wage growth as it relates to health care costs. And uh, I'm going to throw this slide up here. You know, the, the infamous, you know, here's where we are today. Where are we going to be in the future? And we see a future where we are already begin to see this emergence of more consumerism in health care. You know, what's driving that? Why? And you know, we think one of the factors in play here is the growth of consumer-directed or high-deductible health plans. Uh, you look across employer-sponsored care today, about 70% of employers uh, offer consumer-directed plans, at least as an option uh, for their employees, and almost a third of all employer-sponsored uh, care uh, is in some type of consumer-directed or high-deductible plan. And, you know, the challenge with that is we're pushing accountability, we're pushing decision making to that consumer of healthcare, but we have to stop and ask ourselves the question, do those consumers, do they have the tools? Do they have you know, the background and the education with which to make those informed decisions? Because we've seen many examples, when they don't, it's costing them dollars out of their wallets and their pocketbooks. You know, we certainly see, you see technology at the core you know, in our future healthcare system. And we certainly see an important role that technology, uh, data, and analytics uh, will change the way we understand as well as the way we deliver healthcare. I'm seeing numerous companies that are vertically integrating as a strategy to success. 
How do you envision vertical integration and how do you envision it to differentiate CVS? Well, you know, if you look, if you start with, uh, well, I'll say the retail pharmacy industry, there's been a tremendous amount of, uh, let's call it horizontal consolidation, you know, over the last two plus decades. That really began in the late 80s. It continued uh, for the next 20 years. And uh, CVS was fortunate to be uh, an acquirer of many retail pharmacy organizations uh, across the country. You know, about 12 years ago, we made a very, very uh, pivotal step you know, in our journey of becoming a deeper and broader healthcare company, and that was the acquisition of you know, Caremark, uh, at the time one of the uh, country's leading pharmacy benefit management companies. And you know, that journey has continued uh, with acquisitions like Miniclinic, uh, our Quorum Infusion Services, uh, and certainly most recently the Aetna uh, Health Insurance Business. And you know, on the previous slide, we, you saw that, that phrase about the fragmentation uh, that exists in healthcare. And you know, we like to call them the silos of healthcare across uh, the healthcare supply chain. And you know, at CVS, we love icons. You, you see all these icons on that circle. And you know, the, the icons, with the exception of three, represent businesses that CVS now owns. So one of our goals, we can and will break down those silos of care across several dimensions of healthcare, and at the same time, partner broadly with those three icons in the top right, those being providers, hospitals, and you know, ambulatory care sites. You know, and the important point in, in this slide is you see the consumer you know, at the nucleus of our strategy, the consumer uh, being at the center of their care. And, you know, I want to emphasize two themes that we started talking about. One is the emergence of this retail health consumer. And the second point about, you know, we've got to make healthcare more integrated than it's been for several years now. You know, eliminate that fragmentation, break down uh, those silos to care. And, you know, we firmly believe that engaging consumers about their health and making it more proactive versus what today is largely episodic and reactive, if we can engage consumers and do that with the right products and services, we will improve health outcomes. And we know when we do that, we'll reduce you know, overall healthcare costs. And again, you know, go back to the video that we saw, and if we can just focus on the growing incidence of chronic disease, there's a tremendous unlock there in terms of value creation. We can all acknowledge the growing power and influence of consumers in healthcare. CVS has enormous reach into consumers based on its large footprint, access, and breadth of services. Can you walk us through the multiple touch points of how you interact with consumers and patients? Well, Deborah, as we think about uh, the strategy, you see on this slide we interact with one in three Americans uh, you know, every year. And, you know, as we bring this vision, our strategy to life, we, we really have three critical imperatives. And the first is to be local and to meet people where they are, whether it's in their community, uh, in their home, or for many, uh, and what's growing is, you know, the palm of their hand. Uh, we're in 10,000 communities all across the country. Uh, today, about 70% of the U.S. population actually lives uh, within three miles of a CVS. Our second imperative is how can we make this healthcare system that has become extremely difficult to you know, access, use, navigate, how do we make it more simple? How can we provide uh, the necessary information, uh, access to the resources that consumers of healthcare need to make those informed decisions uh, that we talked about earlier? And our community touch points here can be a real differentiator. You know, th let's, let's think for a minute about, you know, the, the neighbors, the friends, the family members that we know, if they're visiting their physician on a regular basis, they're probably visiting them maybe twice a year, maybe three or four times a year. But think about those with chronic disease that have, you know, multiple uh, medication needs or other health needs. They may be visiting their pharmacy a couple times a month. You know, and back to this dynamic of, you know, changing consumer behavior by making health part of their regular everyday routine, we think is a tremendous opportunity. 
We don't have to change the consumer's routine. We just have to make it make health more part of their you know, everyday routine. You know, the third imperative that we have, and it kind of goes back to our purpose, our North Star, is helping people achieve their best health and in doing so reducing overall health care costs. And you know, I mentioned earlier that healthcare is, you know, all too often today episodic. And we talked about the growing incidence of chronic disease. Two thirds of the country has one or more chronic diseases. And you know, you, you pick up a variety of studies, it's anywhere from 70 to 80 percent of healthcare costs, but yet we see the challenges associated with that. And if we just focus on medication adherence as one example, there are studies out there that are saying the lack of adherence to one's medication is costing our system up to $300 billion a year. We look at individuals that are newly diagnosed with chronic disease, and at the end of the first year of being diagnosed, they're not taking their prescription, their medication as prescribed you know, by their physician. We think there's a tremendous unlock here. So, you know, we, we, everyone in this room probably knows someone that has diabetes. So let's go back to, you know, if they're going to their doctor on a regular basis, let's say they're going quarterly. They leave the physician's office with a care plan. The care plan has diet, nutrition, exercise, medication, uh, a regimen for regular blood testing. You know, but what happens between those patient visits? That's where the system fails too many people every day. And we see the opportunity not to replace the role of the primary care physician, but to serve as a complement you know, to what they're doing to ensure that that consumer of health care is following that care plan to avoid the unintended medical event that is both potentially debilitating for the individual as well as costly for the system. Now, you know, Deborah, it's interesting because you know, I, I was giving a talk not that long ago and there was a Q&A associated with it and someone at the end said, look, I hear you using the term patient and consumer interchangeably and I worry about what you're doing, what you're talking about that is going to compromise the physician-patient relationship. You know, and by the way, no sooner, I didn't even get a chance to answer the question, someone on the other side of the room jumped up and said, there needs to be more consumerism in healthcare. So think about the dynamics that we're talking about. And look, when we're in the physician's office, or heaven forbid, you know, the hospital, we absolutely are in the hands of an extremely skilled, trusted health professional. We are a patient at that point in time. But we have to take a minute and stop and think about all the activities that are on the front end of that, and all of the activities that are following that because the system has driven us to be consumers of healthcare at those points in time. So we're really both and it's time based in terms of where we're at in that healthcare spectrum. For our remaining minutes, I think the audience would really like to hear some examples of innovation, both innovation that is currently underway as well as innovation that's being planned for the company and your customers. Well, Deborah, we're actually next month, uh, we celebrate our one year anniversary of CVS and Aetna becoming one company. And I, I have to say, I could not be uh, more pleased and proud of our 300,000 colleagues. They, you know, uh, are working extremely hard. They're very engaged and committed to our purpose uh, and the strategy as we work to bring uh, these opportunities to life in meaningful ways. Probably the, the element that has become most visible to folks is uh, what we're calling our health hubs. You know, it's changing the dynamic of today's neighborhood drugstore. And this is a, a photo of a prototypical CVS that has existed probably for the last you know, 15 years. And you know, we would sit here and say it is a convenience destination. You can find a lot of things beyond you know, health and beauty needs, and, you know, the pharmacy is, uh, you can't see it in this photo, but, you know, it's there in the back of the store. So several months ago, we began in uh, the Houston, Texas market with a concept that we're calling the health hubs, and I'm going to share some photos, and, you know, this is uh, a picture of uh, Miniclinic. It is expanded from, you know, what you may picture a Miniclinic to be today. Uh, we've expanded our 
scope of services we're doing in clinic phlebotomy. Uh, our clinics continue to be staffed by uh, nurse practitioners. Uh, and you can see some of the services that, uh, that are focused both on acute as well as the management of chronic disease. Uh, here's another photo of the pharmacy, and you know, may sitting here, you know, that pretty much looks like the pharmacy when I get back there in my CVS today. What might be different? Well, one of the things that we're beginning to do is to merge medical and pharmacy data. So I talked earlier about the challenges associated with uh, the adherence to medication and the opportunities that we have there uh, to ensure people are staying adherent as well as closing gaps in care. But we also have the opportunity to you know, merge uh, the medical data you know, to deliver you know, a differentiated experience. And, and this is one of the uh, things that we're very excited about in terms of the two companies becoming one. Because if you think about the role of the health insurer today, they have a tremendous amount of information about the members that they serve. You know, and as we're sitting here today, you know, they can determine what I'll call the next best action for each and every one of us. Now, it might be something preventive uh, for someone who's healthy, but let's go back to you know, that individual that we know that has diabetes, and maybe he or she hasn't had their A1C level checked in more than, a, more than a year. The challenge that we would say health insurers have had is, how do I operationalize, how do I activate you know, that information? In the conventional ways today is to pick up the phone through a call center and see if I can gauge you know, my members you know, in terms of you know, having that discussion and creating a level of engagement that will translate into an action. And you've got this faceless voice on the phone uh, or you're sending a letter. So now think about that same intervention being delivered you know, by your local, by your community pharmacist that you know and trust. You know, and now I'm coming in to pick up my prescription and the pharmacist says, Larry, oh, by the way, you know, I've been notified that you have not had your A1C level tested in more than a year. Let me talk to you about the importance of that. And the nurse practitioner, you know, Mary, you know, can perform that service for you, you know, 10 feet away from, you know, where they're talking. So there's a tremendous unlock there. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of how can we engage consumers more in a proactive way about their health, making it part of the routine that they already have established. Uh, here's a, a couple other examples. This is in the front of the store, and I, I probably should have said this earlier. You know, we've repurposed about 20% of what we call the front store. We removed some products, and you know, that space uh, has been freed up for services, for additional products. Here you're looking at uh, items that would fall into the category of convalescence as we think about you know, transitions in care. Uh, here's another you know, photo of you know, the health quadrant of the store. And some of the other uh, elements that we're doing differently, we were, you know, I'll, I'll call it an experiment. Uh, for lack of a better term, you know, we, we're calling uh, these colleagues health concierge. And we weren't sure exactly, you know, what would the level of engagement be with consumers? And what we have found is, it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier in terms of what consumers are looking for in terms of you know, education and tools with which to make informed decisions because the care concierge and the health hubs are getting a tremendous uh, number of questions about, well, how do I use my benefits? Where do I go to find this product that the physician tells me I should have? you know, in my treatment for. And we're really on to something here in terms of, you know, what, uh, you know, what we're describing. So I mentioned our first stores uh, went up in the Houston market. Uh, it absolutely is validating uh, the beliefs that we have. It's many of the things that I talked about earlier. Uh, we'll be in three additional markets by the end of this year, uh, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and uh, Tampa, Florida. And, you know, we have plans underway to have 1,500 uh, of these health hubs all across the country within the next two years. So, uh, you know, our team, our organization is pretty excited about that. Uh, Deborah, back to your question. What, what are some other things that we have underway? Uh, we have a program in Pilot. Uh, it's called uh, Healing Better. 
And uh, think about elective surgery uh, for, uh, let's take joint replacement. Um, we know who, when, and where. And this is where we're challenging the status quo because you know, uh, all too often today, let's say it's knee replacement, person you know, leaves the hospital and they leave with the list of things that they now need to get. Uh, medication for short-term pain relief, uh, shower seat, walker cane, and they're trying to get home, they're uncomfortable, the caregiver, uh, family member is with them, and uh, they're thinking about how do I get my PT started in the next couple days. Uh, well, what if we took that checklist and what if we completed that before you know, the procedure so that all of those things are in the home and the only focus is getting the person you know, from the hospital and getting them comfort, uh, comfortable in the confines of their home. So uh, the early returns from this has been terrific. We also think it, it, you know, it's probably an opportunity to uh, you know, reduce uh, you know, costly hospital readmissions. Uh, Deborah, maybe one other one that I'd mention is uh, you know, we've got a lot of focus on um, you know, chronic kidney disease. And you know, I think it was probably a couple months ago that you know, we saw an announcement from HHS that uh, you know, chronic kidney disease, it now represents about 20% uh, of our Medicare budget. And we have two uh, initiatives underway. One is the early detection you know, of chronic kidney disease through technology and analytics. And uh, we know all too often that it is largely asymptomatic. And, uh, and our goal is through early detection to slow down the progression of, of the disease and the need for dialysis. Uh, the second activity that we have underway is actually a, uh, a, a home dialysis device, uh, hemodialysis, and, and we're working with a technology partner that you know, would allow uh, dialysis to be performed in the comfort of one's home you know, and create the opportunity for more frequent and longer duration uh, for dialysis. And we're excited. We got uh, FDA approval to begin uh, you know, our clinical trials, and that's underway. And if we're successful there, uh, we'll have it in market uh, in uh, the second half of 2021. So, uh, Deborah, again, there's a tremendous amount of energy uh, in the organization. Uh, we're pleased that in less than a year, we've got you know, programs like the Health Hubs uh, up and running, and it's validating, again, our beliefs and uh, many more things in pilot. And, an even longer list on the drawing board. And uh, you know, since we have less than a minute left, I think we'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you, Larry. This has been terrific, a terrific conversation. And you're clearly doing a lot of very innovative things in healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.